Thank you so much for your introduction. We were two kids growing up west coast of Bergen, in the middle of nowhere. We had one dream, and that was to be the best swimmers in the world. There are no other than we, we didn't stand before. The 25th of July, 2011, the Ute accident, the terror on Ute, was happening, and the World Championship in Swimming in Shanghai has started. There were 69 people died in Utah, and the Norwegian country were in shock. If you remember Alex on the television, he was saying, swimming means, means nothing. It doesn't matter. And there he decided either to compete as an athlete or withdraw from the competition. He was luckily and I'm glad he competed and become a world champion. But he did it for the Norwegian people and he did it for the title in Utah. The same day he won the world championships in swimming, I took a silver medal in the world championships in Neville Pentathlon in Rio de Janeiro. We spoke together on the phone and we decided we do, do it together and compete for the nation and for the flag. You have the, the, the two choices, either to cave or not to give in at all. And those choices came back to you in every day, uh, in the early days when you are growing up as a five years old kid and the clock is ticking and you need to decide if I'm going up and going to school or going to stay to bed. In 2011, eight, we had this big dream. We were both going to the Olympics. In the Netherlands, in Eindhoven, the competition started in March and the Olympics was in June. And Alice showed us that it was possible for Norwegian from a small village, west coast of Bergen, to win the gold medals and other medals in an easy, good way. It was my day to race, and uh, I woke up with a big pneumonia in my lungs and high fever. What should I do? I got, went to the coaches and said, hear me out, I'm feeling good, I need to do this chance, I need this chance to fulfill my dream to go to the Olympics. I started swimming and I beat the, the Norwegian record with the hundreds, but I missed also the Castle Olympics with the hundreds. It was a deep disappointment for me not to go to the Olympics at that time, but I had one more shot. It was a relay team in the end of the competition, some days after, and I went to bed and my pneumonia went from bad to worse. I was so sick, I couldn't stand still when I got up in the morning. The race day was on a Sunday and I had two days off and I had to fulfill my dream to go to the Olympics. That day, I lied to all the coaches and the doctors. I'm just fine. I need this shot. How can I manage to not go to the Olympics? It has been my dream the whole life and I've done everything I could do every single day for the last 15 years. I went to the pool deck. I dived into the pool. I saw the half race and my body collapsed. I was drowning, seriously drowning. I've been told Alex jumped in the water and pulled me up to safe ground and helped me survive that day. I went back home in and out of hospital cells 
and uh, it was a couple of years without any any type of swimming at all. But after three years, I was ready to go compete again. I cited my back to the national team, and I went to the World Championships in Melbourne the same year. As you can see, uh, this Ijo club doesn't give me any good at all. A few years before, I was roller skating down a steep mountain of the Bergemere, and my right arm hooked up in a ditch, and I rolled over 360 degrees. I was so hungry for success that I didn't tell anyone about it. I went home, put some painkillers, went to bed, and took a flight next morning. I had a choice to go to a doctor. I had a choice to help uh, me recover, but I didn't have the guts and my dream was so big. I went to the North Norway to compete and the same happened there. I swung the distance, my right arm fell down and I was out. I had a so big injury that it took me years to recover again. This is the picture you see behind me. It's the day Alice died. The 1st of May 2012, I get a phone from my dad in my native house telling me that Alex has fainted in the shower. I was like, yes, just give him a slap hand, slap hand, and it's going to be okay. But he didn't. I took my clothes on, I walked up to the neighbor house to my parents' place, I called Pata, the national head coach from Way, because they were in Flagstaff in training camp. Line broke. My, I remember my dad was sitting on the sofa and my mom was still in bed. The phone rang again and I touched Pat on the phone. He just said, Alice is dead. You can imagine for yourself how tragic it was for the family. It was me and my brother and it was my mom and dad. Then we had two choices. Either to rise up, be strong as a family, or stay to bed with a pillow over your head. And trust me, I can really understand that people do that. Because the pain, we all have been felt it before, the pain we have these days, and all the coverage, international coverage of the accident didn't make it easy for it all. Becky, my wife, joined us after a few hours in our, my dad's house and she was pregnant. We got a son two days after outside called Rick Alexander. And uh, he was, she was telling me, Robin, you don't need all these powers. You don't want all these powers. You should, as you and Alex have discussed before, do something for you. Motivate them to find the inner motivation. To find out what they want. And she knows what she's talking about because she lost her brother a few, few years before in cancer. I'm really glad we took the decision to start a foundation. After London Olympics, 
Me and Alex was supposed to set the world record across Greenland. Skiing. Glacier, it is, yes. And I was selecting young people aged 11 to 16. We were training in Hadalmavira National Park, except, except, exactly the same route as Nansen trained in, in his route. We were so well prepared for that one. And uh, nine days, nine days before the flight to Greenland, I got a phone call from Greenland. They said to me, Robin, we, we are looking forward to your group together. It's awesome what you're doing, but you can't take the girl age 11 with you. This was my dream, it was her dream, we could train for it for a month. So what should I do? I have two choices. Either I could not go, or I can tell her, ah, we're going, but uh, you're not coming with, with us. For me, that choice was really easy. It was, of course, we're going to take this 11-year-old girl with us on the expedition. But how could I do it? How could I change the, uh, the rules in Greenland? I called the Prime Minister in Norway on the cell phone, Jan Stoltenberg. I called him on the cell phone and said, and said Jans, I need your help. Can you please help me? <laughs> yes, I did. And, uh, and the day after, I met Jens and the Norwegian ambassador in, in Copenhagen to discuss the problem with the Greenlanders. We met close door in Copenhagen. They did not want us to go there. They were afraid to take the question up with the Greenlanders. So, I called some friends who's been a lot in the Arctic and asked them, where should we go? We are departing in eight days. Do you have any good ideas for me? <laughs> and uh, yes, one of them they said, yes, Robert, we have. Canada is a really good spot. I haven't been there because it's so damn cold. <laughs> and there's polar bear everywhere you turn around. I just said, okay, I'm going in seven days. No, 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 Robin, you, you need at least a one year of planning to do that. I didn't have money for it. I didn't have time for it. So we went. Took the flight to Canada. We crossed uh, the Arctic in, in Canada in skis. Every of the young people were uh, had dragging their own sled, 70 kilos. And you can imagine when their own weight was 40 kilos. Five meter up, five meter down, five meter round, polar bear. <laughs> yes, we had some problems over there. You, you can see one, you can see one problem, right? And one morning, the 14 year, year old Emil said, Robin, come on, join me in the tent. I need to show you something. This is what he, he was showing me. Fingers big as big as uh, sausages. It was crisis. What could I do? How could I help him get well again for the first? And what was the expedition? Again, two important choices I had to take that day. Should I go back? Should I call a heli? Or should I drag him back, get into the hospital and wait? We dragged him back because there was no possible to use snowmobiles up there because of the five meter up, five meter down polar bears. So we dragged him back, took him to the hospital, and we decided to stay put, wait for the doctors to come back to us. This, after one day, they called us. We advise you guys to go the route. He's going to be fine. It's going to take him maybe one, maybe two years, maybe three years. It, it took actually four years. But we did succeed the route. 
This sounds like a tragic history, but it was a so successful exhibition, the most successful exhibition I ever had. Emil went to the hospital, we went out to the ice looking for polar bears, and uh, for tea. He was living with the Inuits for months. And I believe he's the, the one beside Helge Ingsta, who's the Norwegian, has been living most by the Inuits, this 14-year-old Emil from Lama. Seven years, we've been doing the day long experience, our foundation. We had around 80,000 kids joining us. We have our own school, our own day long center. We have the biggest conferences in Europe, EU school conferences. And we have two science ships, US for one and US for two. They are now in Tunsa doing work in National Geographic, and later on we're going to the Svalbard and actually are doing science on helium bubbles. We make we use our, we use make ROVs. We make satellites shooting out from Andrea. And it's all about building characters. It's all about seeing the young ones. And it's all about giving them opportunities. I said we had a school. Yes, we do. And trust me, it was easy to get the school because they gave it to us. But to get the columns into the school was not that easy. I was invited as a fellow member of the Explorers Club to the recovery of the Jeff Bezos, Bezos expeditions to the Apollo engines in Bermuda. I was so inspired by these mechanical engineers, the engines, that it turns out that I wrote a new column in school, the US Explorer column. I was so happy. I, think it, I thought it was so good, but the Norwegians didn't want it. I went visited school after school after school. They said, no thanks, the school is nowhere perfect. Uh -uh. I took my rucksack, went back to the US, visited New York Harbor School and Riverdale School, and they were all like, oh, thank you for coming. Of course you want to tell us, of course. I went back to Norway, believing I can do anything. Everything is possible. Went back to the schools. Hey, I have this column, we're really using it. You want to you want to collaborate with us? No, thank you. Too perfect. Yeah, believe me, it was it was a it was a tough one. I then took my rucksack. I thought, okay, what about the Russians? <laughs> if I had the Americans and I had the Russians, then I should have the Norwegians, right? So I went to Russia. Visited St. Petersburg. Or calling us. And they, were, they were like, thank you for coming. Of course, we want to collaborate with the Americans. Of course. What about you guys? You don't work with us? No, I'm sorry, I'm from Norway. So we don't we do these columns. I just made it. I went back to Norway after I had Russians and Americans. And then some schools took it in. I'm really glad I had a strong back at that time because it cost cost almost everything we had. But if you take the right choices, you will definitely succeed. Remember, you have two choices, but do one at a time. Thank you so much for listening, and good day.